I'm often sitting across from a patient in the clinic and they say, when should I get a joint replacement? Or should I get a joint replacement? And oftentimes it's a very complex conversation and it's not an easy answer to provide to them. So joint replacement surgery is a really effective treatment for end-stage osteoarthritis, but it's not appropriate for everyone. There's a lot of factors that can influence that decision and that discussion, including a person's age, their overall health, the severity of osteoarthritis that go into making a decision around joint replacement surgery. It's really an important conversation to have because joint replacement rates are going up almost exponentially in many countries around the world. And those trends are likely to continue. And that places a big burden on the healthcare system. That comes with substantial costs. So it's really important that access and equity and quality of care be considered in making indications for that particular procedure. For the individual involved, it's incredibly important that the person who receives that joint replacement be considered as appropriate for that procedure and that it be a safe and effective option for improving their quality of life in their living with that disease of osteoarthritis. So in this week's episode, we touch upon that really important question about is joint replacement surgery an appropriate option with a previous guest, Gillian Hawker, to discuss that really, really important topic. Hello, Gillian. Welcome to the show. Thanks, David. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure of mine and really looking forward to getting into this conversation. And, you know, I guess... Traditionally, we usually give a solid introduction to the guest, but Gillian's been kind enough to grace us with her presence at least once before. And so if you want to listen to Gillian's introduction, I would encourage you to go back to the prior episode we we did with Gillian, which was season two, episode five on the burden of osteoarthritis, where we did a wholehearted introduction of Gillian. And so I guess for the purposes of today, I'm going to get straight into the content. And that's really talking about the appropriateness of joint replacement and some of the discussion around that. So, Gillian, just, I guess, as preface and context for some of the conversation we're about to have, what does having a joint replacement involve and is that an effective procedure? Yeah, so thanks. Joint replacement is effectively taking diseased ends of the joint, whether it's a hip or a knee, those are the most commonly performed taking off or shaving off, removing those damaged ends and putting artificial, um, usually metal, cemented in onto the surfaces of the joint so that it can smoothly now operate to bend and, and stretch. It is a very effective procedure, hips more so than knees when they're replaced. Both procedures are mostly done for people with osteoarthritis, especially knees are done for osteoarthritis. And pretty much every study, and there are many, many, many studies that have looked at the long-term outcomes of people over time, they suggest that probably 90% of people have really good pain relief, more so, again, people after hip replacement than knee replacement, and about 80% have significant, meaningful improvement in their ability to do valued activities, functional activities. So yeah, it's a good procedure. Wonderful. And I, I think that's that's a really good foundation for the rest of our conversation. So in that context, we know that there is some variation around who gets this procedure, but is there some general broad recommendations that you can derive either from prior criteria, your clinical experience on when a total joint replacement might be recommended for a person that has knee or hip osteoarthritis? Yeah, I think there's pretty good agreement that a person who's undergoing surgery should have exhausted available recommended non-surgical therapies, which are safer and less expensive. They should have a really good understanding of the risks and benefits of the surgery. And they should be at a stage where their arthritis is really in their mind, negatively impacting their quality of life. And on examination of the patient, there should be very obvious damage to the joint that's being replaced. So it's clear that they've got need for the surgery, that the risks are not going to outweigh the benefits. 
and that the patient has really good understanding and wants to proceed with the surgery and have exhausted other treatments. Yeah, no, I think a fantastic explanation. It's obviously a very complex area that involves multiple different factors. In general, do doctors or surgeons use those sorts of principles when thinking about who might be suitable for a joint replacement? Unfortunately, I think where we've got stuck is that a lot of the decision making is done by the surgeon in the context of looking at the x-rays or other imaging of the joint. And we know in osteoarthritis in particular that the patient's experience of their osteoarthritis won't necessarily agree well with what's found on imaging. So somebody with really bad x-rays may actually be pretty good and vice versa. They'll put a lot of weight on that imaging because often surgeons will feel more comfortable with what's called objective measures. They're less comfortable with what we call subjective measures, such as patient reported pain, because, you know, lots of things can make the pain experience worse. And so they'll often hang their hat on the x-ray and physical exam, sometimes at the exclusion of how the patient's feeling. And they'll also very heavily weigh the risks of complications. So surgeons don't want to, and I understand that, they don't want to have a a surgery that's complicated by anything that puts the patient at risk. Although the risks of joint replacement associated with joint replacement surgery are pretty low, they still want to make sure that this isn't a person that's likely to have a blood clot or bleed or develop an infection. So they'll generally look at clinical need based on x-ray and physical exam and risks based on other health problems and the clinical situation and often don't engage in a discussion with the patient or enough of a discussion with the patient. Yeah, no, really, really valuable looking at the way it's currently being done. And, you know, I I guess in general, this is going to, again, vary by health system and by surgeon. But is there evidence to suggest that those sorts of discussions that are being had and are currently happening in clinical practice, that there is marked inequity or clinical variation through different healthcare systems or by surgeons about who's actually getting this procedure? Unfortunately, for about three decades now, there has been good evidence that there's substantial variability in how decisions are made. So even within a health system, There will be some surgeons who may err, or not err, but decide to offer surgery to people who are at potentially very low risk and maybe lower need, and others that are really, you know, happy to tackle more complex patients who may be at higher risk but really have high need. They will often vary in terms of their willingness to operate on people with different levels of obesity or weight, because that can be a risk factor for complications. There's also huge differences in how easy it is for people with osteoarthritis to access an orthopedic surgeon, depending on what the the health system flow is. So in Australia and Canada, you need a referral from another doctor, and sometimes that's hard to come by. In other systems, such as the US, if you can go directly to an orthopedic surgeon, it may be much easier. So there's socioeconomic barriers, there's geographical barriers, and there's wide variability in the actual measured pain and disability of people that are currently getting surgery. So they're the sort of context setting questions. And I think you've painted a really uh, colorful but disappointing picture about the current state of the way this is being distributed or allocated to people in need. Now, in some of the literature I've seen, you've described joint replacement as a preference-sensitive procedure. What do you mean by that? Yeah, that, that's an important question. So a lot of surgeries are performed to save somebody's life or to take out something that's going to kill them, like a malignant tumor. And many surgeries are done urgently. So there's no choice. We have to do it. This is a surgery that's effectively performed to improve somebody's quality of life. It's performed predominantly to relieve pain and improve ability to function. 
It's not urgent. It's an, not an emergency by and far. There's lots of time to think about and weigh the pros and cons and particularly the pros and cons in the context of your own situation. So are you working for a living? How much is your osteoarthritis affecting your ability to do the things you want to do? Are you in a caregiving relationship? Whatever. And so that's what preference sensitive means, that any two patients put in front of a surgeon may be identical on x-ray and physical exam, let's say, but they one may really want surgery and the other may really not be ready. And so their preferences and values for care should be influencing whether or not they're getting the procedure. Yeah, no, great, great description. And we're going to dig into that a whole lot further right now. So this conversation in part has been sparked by the fact that there's a systematic review that's recently been published in osteoarthritis and cartilage that Gillian thoughtfully wrote an editorial about, which is looking at this whole concept of appropriateness. Now, Gillian, there are different ways of assessing appropriateness. Can you just elaborate a little bit further on some of the factors involved? And in your response, if you can, touch upon some of the frameworks for us assessing that appropriateness, whether that be the Hawker criteria, as it was described in that paper, or the RAND criteria. But again, if you can just touch upon, I guess, just some different ways of assessing appropriateness first. Sure. So I'll try to make this really simple in construct. So the RAND methodology was developed in the US back in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, in an era when we were well aware that there was significant variability in the likelihood of a variety of procedures, surgeries being performed. So what it does is there's a literature review showing what the actual risk factors for a bad outcome of a surgery are. And though that information is brought to a group of expert physicians, in this case, it might be orthopedic surgeons and rheumatologists, and maybe even some family doctors who discuss the information and a series of patient scenarios. And through discussion consensus, they decide what are the criteria um, by which people should be considered appropriate. That RAND methodology, they score them. And based on the score that's a sum of these various variables or criteria are given a final assessment of appropriate, uncertain, and inappropriate. And that work has to date never involved people with osteoarthritis. And the validation has by, so checking that it makes sense and stands up has largely been done by taking the same case scenarios, patient stories, and putting them in front of other physicians and saying, how would you rate this patient? And if they both say the patient's appropriate, then check the criteria are valid, which is not the intent. Appropriateness is generally defined as a procedure or treatment or surgery that provides net benefit to the patient. And so saying that a procedure gives you less risk than pain improvement doesn't necessarily fit that definition of net benefit to the patient. And until very recently, actually, there hasn't been any proof that RAND developed measures appropriate measures, actually can discriminate at the time the decision's being made, the people that are going to go on to say, this was a good result from the patient's perspective versus this is not a good result. There are a lot of other groups that have looked at ACES registries, national registries, large, large numbers of people that have had hip replacement or knee replacement and looked at predictors of a good outcome. Most of those studies have not defined a good outcome in a yes or no way. They've usually looked at it in a lots or a little way. And generally, they're only as good as the questions that were asked of patients preoperatively. So again, mostly they talk about the level of pain, the level of function prior to surgery, comorbidities, other health problems, etc. So 
they again don't really get at the patient and what the patient is really feeling. So the, the Hawker criteria is work that our group's been working on for a long time, but basically we said, okay, where what do patients think about appropriateness for surgery? So we ask people with hip and knee osteoarthritis. We also ask surgeons, but we basically said, what is your concept of patient appropriateness for joint replacement? And they totally agreed, both groups agreed that prior receipt of treatment was should should have done. They should have demonstrable need for surgery and the risks shouldn't outweigh the benefits. That, that, no problem. So that was all consistent, but they brought up two other really critical points. One was that the patient needed to be ready for surgery. They needed to be motivated to have the surgery. And they talked, especially those who'd been through surgery, they talked about having experienced, particularly knee replacement, it could be very tough going for the first few months after surgery, really tough, very painful, very challenging. They said, you've got to really have a positive attitude, be very optimistic, be very motivated. And they really talked about this ready and willing to undergo surgery. And the other thing that came up both from surgeons and patients and has come up in other discussions by other groups is realistic expectations. That somebody who wants to go back to high impact hockey, I'm speaking as a Canadian, of course, that may not be the best thing to do with a newly replaced joint. So that it's important to understand what's motivating the patient to want to have the surgery. What do they want to do? Is it simply that they want to get rid of the horrible pain they're experiencing? Or do they have very specific expectations for the kind of work they do, the kind of recreational activities they do, etc. So basically, what we had elucidated from that, we subsequently have tested prospectively in people undergoing knee replacement, and we're able to show that people who were ready and willing and had, depending on their expectations, were significantly more likely to experience a good outcome measured as improvement in pain function and satisfaction with results. And that discriminated much better than just looking at level of arthritis, pain, disability, and comorbidities. So back to the paper in OA and C, they basically were saying very few of these studies, in fact, I believe it was five out of the 22 studies that they found, had actually incorporated the patient's perspective about readiness, willingness, and expectations. And so how do you do that? You can't do that with a score. Why can't you do that with a score? Because if I took you and me and had the same x-rays and the same level of pain and the same level of function, the things that are influencing our expectations will include what are our regular activities, maybe our age and our other health problems. What's our environment like? You live in Australia. I live in Canada. You know, do we have little children? Do we have grandchildren? Are we still working? So all of those things influence your expectations. And you can't get at that without, I believe, a conversation. And that is shared decision making, which is what this article basically says is missing from current appropriateness criteria. Tremendous description of an incredibly complex area and I think really reinforces the importance of having that conversation with the patient. And, you know, as as you've really clearly alluded to, those important concepts around expectations, readiness, and motivation for for that really big and important procedure. Do you are you happy just to describe it a little bit? Because I think you did this really well in the editorial that you wrote where we're failing because you know i think the systematic review detailed 55 different studies and they provided really good information about where we're not doing well as far as those appropriateness criteria are concerned around some of those really important concepts because you've you've said quite clearly that you know in a preference sensitive procedure where we know that 
joint replacement ideally should be targeted to the right person at the right time. We know that a lot of the time the right patient is not getting the procedure and those appropriateness criteria that you've just spoken about, particularly those that are based upon the patient's voice are not being heard, are influencing their likelihood of a good outcome. So how are we doing with regards to the appropriateness criteria that we've got? And, you know, and then I'll, I'll get into what we can do as a health system potentially to improve that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think none of us are in the clinic space where a surgeon's talking to the patient, but our qualitative work and other people's qualitative work Patients report back that these things aren't being discussed with them. What we do know for sure is that people are having hip and knee replacement without having exhausted non-surgical therapies. There's a lot of myths out there. You've talked about them on other podcasts about, well, when you've got really bad disease, you know, you can't exercise, you can't be physically active, that would just make the disease worse. That's wrong. And there's good evidence that physical activity can actually improve pain and function, even in somebody with very advanced disease. So most studies suggest that about 70% of people, only 70% of people are coming to surgery, having really had an exhaustive trial of recommended non-surgical therapies. So that's, I think, the first problem. The second thing is around willingness and expectations. So the guidelines, even the RAND appropriateness criteria, which were used to develop the U.S. American arthroplasty guidelines, say, yes, you should, the patient's expectations should be realistic. And yes, they should have exhausted therapy. And yes, should they should be ready and willing. But you should do that after determining if they're appropriate. In other words, first you should think about, do they have the disease and are are they likely to have complications? And if the answer is no to complications and yes, they have the disease, then they're appropriate for surgery. And then you can have these other conversations, but I, I think that's completely backwards, but that's what's currently happening. So are people being asked, why are you here? Why are you seeking surgery? No. If you ask people, what what do they want? Our work and others have shown they want to be able to kneel. They want to be able to get down on the ground with grandchildren or to work. They want to be able to enjoy recreational sport activities. They want to be able to walk. So, you know, we're not all the same. There's huge variability in who wants what. And I'll just pick on kneeling for two seconds because it it struck our group very much that kneeling was really predictive of not being satisfied with your result, with your surgical result. And we know in knee replacement that people don't have an easy time of being able to kneel after surgery. But two thirds of the people in our over 2000 that were asked wanted to be able to kneel better. So there's a complete mismatch between what people were wanting to get from their surgery and what the surgeon already knew they weren't going to get from their surgery. So we know that when people don't have their expectations met, they are dissatisfied. And that dissatisfaction with the outcome is the thing that we're really trying to address now. And you can't address that without addressing readiness, willingness, and expectations. So I don't know if I've really answered that question, but no, you have. I mean, because essentially, I just wanted you to really emphasize the fact that the overwhelming majority of people, well, the overwhelming majority of appropriateness criteria aren't assessing whether a person has appropriate education, weight loss, or exercise prior to being offered surgery. They're not generally considering patient expectations. They're not taking into account patient values, preferences, readiness, and motivation. So I think those are really important concepts. So let's, we've identified the problems. Now, let's at least hypothesize as to potential solutions. So, and there may, it may not be easy, but let's take the non-surgical therapies first. So the availability, access, and reimbursement of exercise, weight loss, and education. How, how do we go about fixing this? So I think this has been a career long journey for both of us, <clears throat> me longer than you. We do not have publicly available access to physical therapy, and we do not have in general, access to or a comfort level with recommendations for physical activity in primary care. 
it's a huge problem. And so the biggest thing for me is given that physical activity is such an incredibly important treatment for all of the chronic conditions that are uh, around us these days, I think people have to be able to access, and I'm not saying exercise, I'm saying physical activity. And that also means safe places to be physically active and, you know, from young ages. So to me, that's, uh, I, I don't get this. We're willing to spend billions of dollars operating, but we can't increase access to physical activity. And we have to convince patients, people with OA and their physicians, that it's actually an effective therapy, which it is. And there's still this sort of somehow belief that surgery is real treatment and physical activity is, you know, not it's harder to have physical, do physical activity than to have a surgery, maybe, but way less risky um, and frankly, pretty darn beneficial. So to me, it really comes down to physical therapy. I think people, people generally are getting analgesic painkillers, maybe not the right ones, but they're getting them, variably getting injections into their joints, but it's really the physical activity and education about OA that, that they're really not getting. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think it's completely counterintuitive that we're willing to spend, as you said, billions of dollars on inappropriate imaging and oftentimes inappropriate surgery. But we're not necessarily willing to do that at a public health level. And we really need to get our policymakers, payers and others on board to understand that there is a large cost effectiveness element here that they would ultimately benefit the community from. Um, the other element that you've really clearly alluded to here is the fact that, in general, appropriateness criteria and oftentimes the conversations that are being had are not considering patient expectations, patient values, preferences, readiness, and motivation. How do, how do we fix that? Well, a billion-dollar question, too. Obviously, I've thought about this a lot. I, I don't think surgeons are the right people to be having the conversation, I think they're they're in a difficult position. And I think it also puts the patient a bit in a difficult position, particularly if they're in my country, for instance, where they may have waited a long time to get to see that surgeon. And they've built up their expectations of getting the procedure. It's kind of hard then to sort of really have an open conversation. I do think you need somebody who understands the surgery and how joints work and what the surgery is all about. I'm going to I'm going to go to physical and occupational therapy because I think there's always therapists involved in the surgical process from preoperatively through all the rehab to post op. I think and most of the programs do some kind of formal education and often it's, it's often it's done by physical therapists. So I think we have to remove this conversation from the surgical consult and have it ahead. So the way I see it is at the time of referral, if there is a referral to surgery, I think there has to be an assessment, a proper assessment that surgical therapies have been tried. And I also think that it's useful to determine at that point does the patient feel that their symptoms are unacceptable? And that's a single question that can be asked, and we found it's a pretty darn useful one. And are they willing to consider surgery if it were offered now? Would they undergo it? Those are really easy questions, and they are very useful questions. They shouldn't be seeing a surgeon if the answer is no to any one of those. If the answer is yes, 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 then I think we need a physical therapist or somebody Maybe it's a retired surgeon, but somebody that's not the surgeon that's going to operate and who's got a little bit more time to talk to the person about assuming they've got bad osteoarthritis and they've got pain and disability. Why are they here? What are they looking for? What would make them happy at the end? And is that based on all the other health problems, the other musculoskeletal problems, usually these people have another knee and another hip that are involved, you know, are they likely to get those expectations met? And if they're not, then maybe there needs to be a resetting of expectations 
and the discussion. Is the patient okay with, well, maybe I won't be able to do this, or it's not sure if I'm going to be able to do this, but I will be able, I highly likely to do this. So I, it's a conversation. And to me, it has to happen before they then go in and have the decision made formally. But I think putting them in, I, the surgeons just won't, they don't have the time. Nor do I think it's this, the communication piece, it takes a skilled communicator. And, you know, I'm not saying all orthopedic surgeons are not skilled or communicators. There are many that are excellent communicators, but they have big, busy clinics and uh, and they're pressured for time. And maybe that's not the right place to have these kinds of conversations. Yeah, and I think it, it provides a wonderful emphasis to the importance of that shared decision-making piece and the time and the importance of that detailed and thoughtful conversation that takes into account all of those patient factors that you spoke about. Is there any role and are there any available um, decision aids that can assist that conversation that you're familiar with? Only the one that we developed in press right now and Annals of Rheumatic Disease Open is our validation of the criteria that we've talked about. So demonstrable need, readiness, willingness, expectations, and in fact, comorbidity, other health problems made absolutely no, it did not influence outcome once you took those other things into account. And so that's in press. And the question is, what do we do with that? And the reviewers of that work pushed me very hard to come up with a score. And I don't feel that's what should happen. I've basically suggested, we've suggested what I just discussed, that it has to be a conversation. But the willingness question, the acceptability of symptoms, those are validated single question measures that are easy to do. We know what the recommended non-surgical therapies are. And we use the Hospital for Special Surgery Joint Replacement Expectation Scale which has a list of items, a list of expectations that people could easily just complete before going in and having the conversation to prompt them. We didn't really find that people elicited other things that they wanted. They were all on that list, but they really were variable depending on age and gender and occupation and urban rural status, lots and lots of things. So I think, I think we found some really good tools that are already shown to be valid and reliable and could be used easily in clinical practice to help inform that conversation. The piece that I'm not sure how to make happen is who's going to have the conversation. And that's the piece that I think rather than talking about having the conversation, I think we all agreed we should be having a shared decision discussion. I think we now need to figure out, okay, in the context of orthopedic practice, where does this happen? Who who does it? Who's responsible? Yeah, no, and that's the big unanswered question. I wasn't necessarily pushing you in the direction of creating a score. It was really just, is there a really readily available framework or some points that we should be covering off in that discussion? And that, that ideally, the patient who's considering this can consider in advance so that that can help to inform that conversation that they ultimately have with that person that's going to give them the time, the space to consider all of those factors. Last but not least, is there any particular advice that you think is really valuable that we may not necessarily have covered for people who are thinking about a joint replacement? These days, most people have multiple problematic osteoarthritic joints. It's rare to have a single knee or a single hip that's the problem. And this procedure does a really good job on that joint that's being replaced. But if you've got pain and disability due to lots of other joints or your back or a prior stroke, or it doesn't get rid of those things. So again, expectation setting, context setting, it, it, there's a big picture that people have to focus on that I think often clinicians don't. They're focused on that one piece of anatomy. So I think 
that's important. But I don't want people to leave thinking that this is not a great procedure. It's a universally fabulous procedure. So now we're we're tweaking because it's such a good procedure that people are asking for when maybe they don't need it yet, or maybe they don't need it at all, or maybe other therapies would be actually safer and better, or maybe the likelihood that they're going to be happy with the results is so low that we've got other things to offer them. So I, I think that's really the message. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that's a really, really helpful way to conclude that particular part of the conversation because the message we're trying to convey today is that it is a wonderfully effective procedure for the right person at the right time. The challenge at the moment is that a lot of the people who are getting it aren't necessarily appropriate for surgery and or those factors that are considered in the appropriateness criteria that Jillian so wonderfully described are not being included as part of why a person gets surgery. And that's leading to a lot of potentially poor outcomes, but also a lot of variation and inequity in in the health systems that we have uh, around. Jillian, are there any other closing points you want to make? Again, I would encourage people, if they want to listen to Jillian's responses to my traditional closing questions, to go to that prior episode. But are there any other closing points you want to make? No, you know, I guess the only thing is that I've actually been focused on joint replacement for osteoarthritis for about 30 years now. And it's so nice that the field is actually interested in talking about this procedure. It hasn't been of interest to most people. And and it's pretty important in our management of osteoarthritis. So I'm I'm glad we're talking about it. I'm glad people are writing and thinking about it because I think ultimately as rheumatologists even, we should be able to have this conversation with our patients. I don't think my colleagues would be comfortable. They need to get comfortable. So I'm just happy that we're having this conversation, not in the context of a surgical meeting. Wonderful. Gillian, thank you so much for sharing those wonderful insights on such such an important topic and for your passion and enthusiasm for that really important area of cl- clinical medicine and, and surgery for that matter and patient care, because I think it's so informative. And I, I think the the recent flurry of activity at the journal around this space is really a testament to the fact that, as you say, there's a lot of interest in this area. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of discussion that's going on and a lot that still needs to be worked out and a lot of improvements that need to happen in healthcare systems. So thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the time to talk about this important topic. Now, I think the important element that we want to get across today is that joint replacement is effective for the right person at the right time. The unfortunate aspect to care at the moment is that many people who are getting surgery are not appropriate for this procedure for any number of different reasons. And and unfortunately, that's leading to a lot of inequity and clinical variation in the healthcare system. But also, unfortunately leading to poor outcomes for people that are going along and having surgery without appropriate expectations or readiness or motivation for that. So when you're considering having joint replacement surgery, just think about those factors that are important to you, your readiness, your willingness to have that procedure. It's not just about the picture on the x-ray. It's not just about your pain. It's not just about the other comorbidities that go along with osteoarthritis. It's really important to take into account your preferences and your expectations and your willingness to have that procedure before you do so. And ideally do that in a conversation that's informed and engaged with a healthcare professional who's willing to spend the time, effort, and interest to have that conversation with you. Now, we're going to provide a number of links to today's podcast that hopefully allow you to dig into this a little bit further, that being both the systematic review that we alluded to and the editorial. And there's now been some ensuing letters that have followed on from this. And so we'll provide some links to that just in case you want to dig into that a little bit further. But again, just to emphasize, it's critically important that you as a person that has osteoarthritis who is considering surgery, have that conversation with a healthcare professional who's willing to spend the time and has the interest in your long-term quality of life. Because ultimately, that's what we're interested in. We're interested in your outcomes, your quality of your life, and the improvement in healthcare systems that hopefully will ensue from appropriate equity in the distribution of this really precious resource. So again, thank you to Gillian for spending the time with us. Thank you to you for listening. And between now and when next we speak, 
please do take care of yourself. Thanks for listening to Joint Action with David Hunter. If you like our show and want to know more, visit www.jointaction.info. If you have any questions, you can email us at hello at jointaction.info and follow us on Twitter at jointactionorg. This podcast was hosted by David Hunter, edited by Vicky Duong, music produced by Jordan Hunter. The information posted on this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. Anyone seeking medical advice should consult a health professional.